everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's event. My name is Ilana Tahan, and I'm the lead curator of Hebrew and Christian Orient at the British Library. In association with our partners, Jewish Book Week, we are presenting today a panel conversation exploring the Jewish presence around the world. This is one from a program of events supporting our exhibition, Hebrew Manuscripts, Journeys of the Written Word. The exhibition provides a snapshot of the range and richness of Hebrew manuscripts in the British Library's collection and reveals the power of the written word to bring people together. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the event, you can submit them using the question box below. A selection of questions will be presented to the panel towards the end of the event. Use the menu above to provide us with feedback about the event and also to donate to the British Library. The British Library is a charity. Your support helps us open a world of knowledge and inspiration for everyone. You'll find social media links below this video in case you want to continue the conversation on other platforms. You can also find out more about this event and read short biographies of our speakers. Today's panel features Dr. Sara Menasse, Dr. Joanna Newman, and Dr. Drew Shun, and it is chaired by Rachel Shabby. Rachel is an award-winning journalist, author, and broadcaster. Now, without further ado, we'll turn the time over to Rachel. Hello, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this event. It's my absolute pleasure uh, to be chairing this and to be with you this evening. This is one of a series of events uh, online um, with the British Library and also with Jewish Book Week designed to get us through lockdown. And I have to say, while I, like everyone else, um, am much looking forward to doing all this in real life, um, there is something to be said for being able to uh, chair this incredible panel with such wonderful panelists without even leaving my house. So um, without further ado, let me please tell you a little bit about our panelists this evening. First of all, we have Dr. Sara Manasse. She is an ethnomusicologist and performer of music in the Iraqi Jewish tradition. She uh, founded the music group Rivers of Babylon and her publications include Shpahoth, Songs of Praise in the Babylonian Jewish Tradition. Next, we have Joanna Newman, who is the Chief Executive and Secretary General of the Association of Commonwealth Universities. Um, she, her new book, Nearly the New World, tells the story of Jewish refugees who overcame persecution and sought sa safety in the West Indies from the 1930s through to the end of the war. That book, by the way, has a special 25% discount on it if you click on the tab above the video on your screen. And finally, we also have Dr. Jo Shun, is a reader in history at the University of Essex and has in the past 20 years been living across London, Jerusalem, Beijing and Hong Kong. She's among Europe's leading historians specializing on modern China, and she is also the author of a number of books, including Chinese Perceptions of the Jew and Judaism. Now, these are all but tiny snapshots um, of the biographies of these three incredible panelists. Uh, please do check out more information online um, because I really haven't done credit um, to their vast and extensive portfolios. Um, but without further ado, I do want to hand over to our panelists, beginning with uh, Dr. Sara Manasse and a short presentation from her. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. 
Thank you to Jonah Albert and the British Library for inviting me to participate in this event, which is linked, as Ilana Tahan said, to the Hebrew Manuscripts Exhibition. I dedicate my presentation from Baghdad to Bombay Beautiful, to my parents, the late Albert Manasseh and Rachel Manasseh, and to the memory of my brother, the late Rabbi Yaakov Menashe of the Midrash Ben Ishai in New York. He passed away earlier this year following complications of COVID-19. Okay, so my mother's book, Baghdadian Jews of Bombay, Their Life and Achievements, a personal and historical account, is published by Midrash and forms the basis of this presentation. India has indeed provided a safe home for Jewish people fleeing persecution. I grew up in the Iraqi Jewish community of Bombay, the focus of this short presentation. Arabic speaking Jews from cities in Mesopotamia, such as Baghdad and Basra, and from Syria and Aden, had settled earlier in Surat, which is north of Bombay, that's today's Mumbai. From about the end of the 18th century, they began to move to other cities in India, to Bombay on the west, Calcutta on the east, and later to Pune, which is south of Bombay. They are variously known as Baghdadian, or Baghdadi, or Babylonian, or Iraqi Jews, and were later joined by Persian-speaking Jews fleeing from Mashhad, and by Central Asian Jews from Russia, Bukhara, and Afghanistan. They all followed the Baghdadian Jewish religious rite, the Minhar Babli, the Babylonian custom, and were part of the Iraqi Jewish community in Bombay, which included a small number of Jews from Cochin. Bombay, originally a group of islands, is surrounded by the sea, which provides a constant backdrop to the city. It was by sea that settlers came to India on a journey, often perilous, particularly during the monsoon season. My mother's family arrived in the early 20th century. Her father, Ruben Eliyahu Arni, arrived in 1911. And his wife-to-be, Gurjiyi Judda, arrived along with both families in 1919, traveling from Baghdad to Basra, where they boarded an English ship. And the whole happy company sailed down the Persian Gulf to Bombay to a wedding there in 1919. Life then moved at a gentler pace, and as my mother writes, for years, my father owned a carriage and horse, and the coachman would drive us children, three sisters and two younger brothers, with our two ayahs, to the bandstand in the evening when we were small. It was not until World War II that my father bought a car and we motored into the 20th century. Now, my own father's family in Bombay goes back still further to 1832, when David Sassoon arrived in Bombay. He had escaped from Baghdad via Basra to Bushir, fleeing persecution from the Turkish Wali, Daoud Pasha, in 1830. David Sassoon settled in Bombay with his wife and young family, joining the cosmopolitan mix of people there. He was soon the acknowledged head of the Arabic-speaking Jewish community in Bombay, winning the respect of all communities. The, inf the influence of the Sassoon family was far-reaching. They have been called the Rothschilds of the East. They provided work for their co-religionists in their firms and mills. They built schools. And at the David Sassoon Benevolent Institution, children were taught to sing God Save the Queen in three languages, English, Hebrew, and Arabic. They also built beautiful synagogues, the Marien David Synagogue in Baikala, the Ohel David Synagogue in Pune, known locally as Lal Devil, which means Red Temple, and his grandson, Sir Jacob Sassoon, built the Knesset Eliyahu Synagogue. Last year, the beautifully reno renovated synagogue received a UNESCO award. The Sassoon family also made generous endowments to public institutions in Bombay and Pune, including the David Sassoon Library and Reading Room in Bombay in the 1860s. David Sassoon was further honored in 1994 when Hope Street, adjoining the library, was renamed David Sassoon Library Marg. Marg means Hindi in Hindi or Marathi way. My mother was invited as a chief guest. In Pune, David Sassoon also contributed to the infirm asylum and the Sassoon General Hospital. What we see here is another landmark, the full-length 
marble statue of Prince Albert at the Victorian Albert Museum, now known as the Dr. Paul Dargilard Museum. Um, on the plinth, there are inscriptions in Hebrew and English. David Sassoon's son, Albert Sassoon, constructed the Sassoon Docks, the first dock in Bombay. And his grandson, Sir Jacob Sassoon, contributed liberally towards the Gateway of India at Bombay Harbor. Now, moving from Sassoon monuments to the Sassoon family, Aziza Sassoon, the granddaughter of David Sassoon and my great grandmother, married Ezekiel Abraham Gabai in 1853. They had a number of children. One of their younger daughters was my grandmother, Sarah. This is the invitation to her marriage to Imneshi Yaakov Imneshi, who had come from Baghdad. And it's written in Hebrew and also handwritten Rashi characters in the Eastern script. And it's mainly in Judeo Arabic, which continued to be spoken in India among Iraqi Jews. Their son, Albert Manasseh, married Rachel Arni. So this is the ceremony of my parents at the Knesset Eliyahu Synagogue. The synagogue choir in Baikala was founded in 1934, and the British influence is very evident in their dress, mortar boards, and gowns. They performed every Shabbat and for life cycle events. Their repertoire maintained the Iraqi Jewish tradition, as did customs such as placing amulets on a baby's cradle or clothes when they were born. In 1935, my father, Albert Manasseh, together with his friend Solomon Ezra, introduced the youth organization Habonim, which is Hebrew for the builders in Bombay, later expanding it, um, for example, in 1938 to Calcutta and followed by centers in Cochin and Pune. They had a lively cultural program which included folk dancing and songs in Hebrew. Annual camps at hill stations such as Mathuran were a highlight. And in this song session on the steps of the large bungalow, I'm one of the leaders standing on the right and my brother is the little boy sitting quite near me in the third row on the extreme right. My family left in the mid 1960s, but my father as life president of the Sassoon Charity Trusts visited regularly, attending to needs of the synagogue and the community. At the entrance of the Knesset Eliyahu Synagogue are three plaques and the one on the right pays tribute to my father, Albert Manasseh, Albert Abdullah Manasseh, who served as head and spiritual leader of the community for over 50 years. The synagogues continue to function, and for the past 10 years, my late brother, Rabbi Menashe, visited regularly in his capacity as spiritual leader. The re-inauguration ceremony at the Knesset Eliyahu Synagogue was attended by dignitaries, members of Mumbai's Jewish and Indian communities, and visitors from abroad. The opening address was given by Solomon F. Sofa, chairman and managing trustee of the Sir Jacob Sassoon and Allied Trusts. Sitting on the left are my brother, Rabbi Yaakov Menashe with black hat, the Israeli Consul General Yaakov Finkelstein in the center, and Judge Abraham Sofer from the United States revisiting his boyhood synagogue. In this slide, the congregation stands while Rabbi Menashe recites a blessing. To conclude and to return to the theme of this evening, the Jewish diaspora in search of safety. India has always offered a safe haven to its people. The word anti-Semitism was one that I had never account encountered while growing up in Bombay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah Manasse. That was absolutely fascinating. I loved the family story and also some of the imagery there um, from Bombay. That was brilliant. Um, can I now move to our next panelist, um, Joanna Newman? Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel, and it was fascinating and a treat to, to see that history. And uh, it reminded me of the original invitation to do a British Library event pre-COVID in the British Library itself. Um, and uh, the discussion I had with the British Library about how I would present my talk, because in some ways they wanted me to say, to show how interwoven the history of Jewish immigration to the Caribbean is. And in fact, I found out about uh, Jewish immigration in the 1930s, refugee immigration, because I'd been researching the Jewish community of Barbados in the 17th and 18th centuries. 
uh, and um, I'd found the minute books of the Jewish community of Barbados, which was a fascinating study really of a, of a community that came to Barbados because they'd been expelled from Spain and Portugal as a result of the Catholic Inquisition and became very skilled in sugar production in Bahia in uh, Brazil. And eventually some of them went to um, plantations and uh, slave economies in the Caribbean as the Caribbean changed from small plantations to slave economies. And um, while researching this history, I was in the Tate and Lyle archive in Sugar Wharf in London, looking at papers of the sugar, the history of sugar industry there, which is a, a fascinating and toxic history, uh, and came across lots of papers uh, that were being thrown away because they were partly in German and they were related to the 1930s about the internment of a Jewish chemist called Edward Schoenbeck. Uh, so um, Edward Schoenbeck turned out to be the first refugee I met in New York and interviewed for my book, uh, who had gone to Jamaica as a chemist, worked for the West India Sugar Company, but during the war had become interned. And so I became really intrigued by this story of really unlikely refuge why was the West Indies not the place one would think of as a traditional refugee involved in this refugee story and the, the tragedy of the 1930s and then the 1940s and the Holocaust? And what I found out is, of course, it's a story of exclusion. I mean, it's a very sad story. About 5,000 refugees in total, we think, reached different uh, West Indian colonies owned by, uh, at the time, owned and colonised by the Dutch and British governments because... Um, uh, they, they were not um, overtaken by, uh, by the Nazis, um, but they were, um, they, they were very much um, the last resort. And they were the last resort because most countries wouldn't allow them in. And so, uh, and most countries wouldn't allow them in because there are two currents going through this story. The first is that actually the numbers of refugees leaving Nazi Germany was in the whole not massive and could have been assimilated probably by the United States and Britain and other allied countries before occupation. But there was this phantom of mass emigration from Eastern Europe where the majority of the Jewish population indeed lived. And most of the research I've done, which uncovered British attitudes to immigration and to refugee policy, uncovers the fact that even when it was possible to allow refugees from Nazi Germany into colonial dependencies, the argument mainly went from the colonial uh, authorities that they were not going to do so because if they did, the hordes of Eastern Europe might, might, might come. And, and I document this in, in my book. And what's ironic about that is that the first person I met in Barbados uh, who had come to the West Indies, he came from Lublin in Poland. He was a young electrician who in the late 1920s got on a boat to Venezuela. There was anti-Semitism, there was rising unemployment and poverty and decided to make a new life for himself in South America, which many people did from Eastern Europe at the time. He, the boat stopped in Barbados, he liked it and he stayed there. And when I met him in the early 90s, he had um, been influential, in fact, a uh, seminal in uh, restoring the ancient Sephardic synagogue that existed in Barbados. And so, you know, when, when Henry Altman and others arrived in the late 1920s and early 1930s, uh, Curaçao and Jamaica still had Jewish communities from that period, but Barbados didn't any longer. And so it was these Eastern European community that, restuck, that renewed the, the Jewish a tradition there and restored the synagogue. And what's interesting about Henry Altman and many like him is that hundreds of Eastern Europeans actually emigrated to the West Indies during this period, completely under the British radar. So while all the legislation uh, and discussion about refugees is, is, is being governed by a fear of Eastern European immigration. Actually, Eastern European immigrants fit in really well. They are small scale traders, they trade in dry goods, they extend credit, they, 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 they go across the islands um, providing um, a new type of credit to uh, poor families. Uh, Arthur Ince, who was a Guardian correspondent for the Trinidad uh, Guardian told me that he remembers very well a Jewish peddler who extended credit to his mother and enabled him to have new clothes and go to school. Remember at the time, 
the West Indies was a very uh, was suffering huge poverty and inequality. There were large scale labour riots and massive desire for change uh, following the participation, particularly in in the First World War. So there are journeys by Eastern Europeans to the Caribbean, which are kind of unnoticed and go under the radar. And then what happens is in the 1930s, a refugee crisis uh, is launched as uh, Nazi Germany um, increases its anti-Semitic laws and its persecution and its legal persecution as well. And um, the sort of the famous point really of, of no return is always um, pointed to the Evian conference in 1938 when uh, under the invitation of President Roosevelt, countries get together to discuss the refugee crisis and what they might do. And Nazi Germany um, um, exploits the fact that no country wants to take in refugees as a result of the Evian conference. And in fact, only a few years ago, the High Commissioner for Refugees uh, referred back to the language used at the Evian conference as a chilling reminder of the language being used today when it's when discussing boat people and the plight that refugees have currently in trying to leave where they are and and reach safety. So um, my grandmother, who was born in Berlin, gave me a book called the Philo Lexicon, and the Philo Lexicon was a book published in 1934 and 35 by Jewish organisations, and it printed places in the world that didn't require visas. Now in 1934 and 35, most Jews in Nazi Germany or Nazi occupied Europe but later on probably weren't that uh, conscious about Trinidad being a destination. They were thinking much more about bordering European countries, uh, perhaps the United States. But as persecution increased and as the avenues for escape narrowed and the windows uh, closed on any kinds of, uh, of escape, places like Trinidad became incredibly important. So Trinidad, Shanghai, anywhere that didn't require a visa. And refugee agencies found out at the same time and started chartering ships, putting refugees on the ships and paying the entry deposits to allow refugees in. By 1939, mid-1939, um, Trinidad has about 600 Jews crowded in Port of Spain um, with local Jewish organizations helping them to settle and helping them to find um, places to live. I feature in my book, and I'll, I think I'll close in a moment here, uh, I feature in my book the stories of many of these refugees, and they're just to give you a few. Um, Hans Stetcher came from Vienna as a 14-year-old boy. For him, it was a massive adventure, and he talks about the colours and the, the exoticism of landing in a tropical island like Trinidad, and it, it reminded him of the Ernst May adventure stories he'd read as a boy. But he also remembers when he was interned a few years later, how an old man hung himself and the despair that older refugees found. So that's another theme that I explore in the book is about the difference uh, in tenacity and uh, resilience if you're a, a young person who manages to flee or you're caught up in it uh, as an older person. And of course, many refugees from Nazi Germany were not young, fit uh, people who could go and, uh, and work uh, uh, in, in colonies, which was, of course, some of the ideas muted for refugee settlements at the time. They were doctors and dentists and uh, bakers and uh, diamond cutters, and they didn't, they, they weren't in the point where they could easily adapt to a new life. Um, I, I also wanted to talk about Malka and Manfred Goldfish. You feature a lot in my book because I've met their daughter, uh, uh, Manfred's daughter, Sue Goldfish, who's actually written a film about her search for her father. And they left Hamburg in 1939 and went to Trinidad. And when they left Hamburg and waved goodbye to their parents, it was the last time they saw them because to, um, in 1942, uh, Manfred's uh, parents were deported to Theresienstadt where they died. And in fact, most refugees who did manage to escape left families behind in Europe and would not see them again. Um, and, and that's sort of that. That's the, the the next point, I suppose, in along the story is that as the refugee crisis gets worse, refugee agencies are the unsung heroes of my book, and they are the unsung heroes of the 1930s and the 1940s. And there should be more attention on the Cecilia Rozovskis and the other tireless workers who were posted in 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 European cities and throughout the Americas, helping refugees, and just wanted to draw your attention to something which has so much resonance for today's refugee crisis, 
when in uh, most people might have heard of the St. Louis, which is a famous ship which was bound for Cuba with refugees on board. It was re uh, refused entrance and it went from pillar to post across the Americas and eventually ended up back in the UK. In my book, I have many uh, voyages like this. Uh, there are many other St. Louis. And at the time, the joint, which was one of the leading agencies, uh, had a telegram to other agencies saying, we're in a quandary um, because there is a continual similar dumping of shiploads of refugees and we have no alternative but to refuse financial help. Important question in principle to be canvassed with other organisations to determine decision to these passengers in the future. Now, the British and others said maybe it's kinder to return them to Germany, but of course these refugee agencies wouldn't do that. And just as the refugee agencies today are faced with illegal trafficking of refugees and people being dumped in boats, the Joint's report was um, the journeys to nowhere and talks explicitly about boatloads of dumped refugees. And so the dilemmas I think that refugee agencies face today have very stark parallels with, with my story then. Of course, the refugees settle in the Caribbean. Um, they, many of them are interned, and I talk about the internment experience. In Jamaica, a very different story, very few before the war. During the war, a special camp is built in 1940 to house 9,000 Gibraltarians who were evacuated from Gibraltar. Most don't come. By 1942, Herbert Emerson, the High Commissioner for Refugees, says, can we put some refugees in this camp? Um, by that time, uh, uh, the British authorities resisted as much as they could. Nevertheless, January 1942, numbers of refugees do end up in Gibraltar camp and actually go there all the way throughout the war. Um, and, uh, and despite the U-boat uh, war and despite the lack of shipping, they are actually taken from Spain and Portugal, from Portugal and from Lisbon and brought across, across the water and stay there. Um, to lesser degrees of satisfaction as these are younger refugees who want to fight. At the end of the war, the majority of the refugees leave. Um, for many of them, it was a, a spell before they could get to the new world. That's why my book's called Nearly the New World. It wasn't a place they wanted to settle in, but for some, it became a permanent refuge. And actually, if you look in the phone book in Trinidad, you'll see Fagenbaums and you'll see um, uh, Averbuchs and you'll see the presence in a way of the, this Jewish presence from the 1930s. And, and I just wanted to finish with a quote from Henry Altman, who told me what it felt like to settle in Barbados. And he said, when we first came to Barbados, it happened that most of us had blue eyes and the original Jews had black eyes, the ones who came from the Mediterranean, the Spanish and Portuguese, and they were suspicious, the Barbadians. They, they thought that we were Germans. It is a fact. And people called us Germans until war broke out. Then slowly they realized that we were not. We are Polish Jews. Most of us are Polish Jews. We always thought that we would leave the island and go somewhere else, like to New York, America, Canada, but somehow we loved it here and we are Barbadians. Wow, thank you so much for that, Joanne. That is such, uh, I could listen to that for a lot longer. There's so many uh, strands woven into that um, presentation and, and you're right, the, the echoes with today are just so striking. This evocation of, you know, the phantom of mass immigration and sort of scaremongering and fear about hordes is so, so um, relevant to the kind of conversation we're having around immigration today. Um, thank you so much for that. And now last and but not least, can I please um, introduce Dr. Shunju? Thank you. Good evening. Um... Uh, um, okay, um, I'm going to um, still on this trip, this journey, and I'm going to take you a little bit further, further from where Sarah went. Sarah went as far as um, Baghdad, and um, then from Baghdad, we're going to move to China. Um, okay, this um, gentleman, his name is Marty Ricci, he was some um, Portuguese Jesuit missionary, and he went to China. And uh, become um, he become quite a cenophyte and um, was quite controversial. He, he, you know, he, he tried to convert Chinese, but uh, instead he become he became Chinese. He was dressed in Chinese robe. You can see. Okay, so um, in 1605, um, July 26, 
he wrote a letter to his superior and regarding and so in the letter he was very excited he, and he told that he had met a Jew from Kaifeng in central China and this letter become you know kind of um, available to the general reading public 10 years later and um, and so there's lots of people were excited and um, you know to hear about the Jews living in China um, and, and, and then there were other missionaries, um, Franciscans and Dominicans, who also went to China. They were not particularly, they, they all went to Kaifeng. Um, they were not particularly interested in finding Jews. They were more interested in the Jewish Bible, um, but they didn't come back with any um, Hebrew manuscripts um, until um, hundred, uh, kind of 200, uh, well, 300 years later, um, and uh, um, you know, kind of um, the um, the story of the these Chinese Jews began to um, catch Western imagination again. And uh, um, in eighteen forty, um, yeah, forty forty five, um, there was some um, James Feng. You probably the name rings um, to some of you. He and um, he was um, um, the British consul to Jerusalem. And um, he was a um, Christian missionary. He was a Christian. He was a, so he was interested in Jews because, you know, he was um, trying to look. He was looking for the lost tribe. Um, you know, and um, so he it was um, actually in the British Library. He had uh, um, read the um, the Jesuits' writings about um, the Jews of Kaifeng, and uh, so um, he wrote. So he published. Uh, this um, quite comprehensive book. The book is uh, still available, I think, um, certainly in the British Library called The Jews of China. Um, it was a much more detailed account of uh, this um, a Jewish community um, in, a, in China, in Kaifeng. Um, although interesting, and then he subsequently published another one called The Orphan Colonies of Jews in China. And um, Although the interesting thing is, he's never been in China. He just, uh, you know, kind of um, used um, the material which is available to him, and um, you know, kind of basically wrote this story. And um, and then, but that was um, so that revoked the interest in the Chinese, the, the Jews of China. And uh, after him, after the publication of his works, uh, a number of Protestant missionaries. Um, went to Kaifeng and to look for the Chinese Jews, and um, they apparently found uh, the, 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 the Kaifeng Jews. So they, they took some pictures, and um, these are, um, you know, kind of, then the, the two brothers in the image, they, they were brought to Hong Kong because um, when they, the, the Protestant missionaries were quite disappointed. When they went to um, you know, kind of Kaifeng and met this community, none of them speak Hebrew. Yeah, they um, they only uh, kind of their story goes back to Moses, but you know, kind of other than that, um, there is um, so they don't really know any of their Jewish heritage. So um, most Protestant missionaries de decide to educate them. So they brought these two brothers to Hong Kong to teach them, um, you know, kind of Hebrew. And so unfortunately, one of them died in Hong Kong, the other one who couldn't endure the um, hardship, what well, he could have, and so he escaped. Um, okay, so that was some, um, the, you know, kind of, that was a picture taken in the Republican China, sort of early 20th century of that community. Um, now the community actually identify themselves um, as Jewish. Interestingly, in 1949, after the people's uh, communist took over China and founded the People's Republic of China. They start dividing the Chinese population into um, you know, eth different ethnic groups. And they invited the leader of this um, um, you know, Jewish community, I call them inverted commas, still the, the, I think their identity is still in question um, somehow. Um, and um, so uh, the, uh, they, they, the, the Chinese government actually uh, you know, kind of invites the leader of this community and um, um, wanted to you know kind of make them jewish a jewish ethnic group but they refused very interesting um, but now they have um, become jewish 
um, again. And um, so um, this community has, uh, you know, kind of they, they still, there are streets of this community, um, you know, kind of lived and, um, and they become major um, Jewish tourism um, for the city. Um, and actually one member of um, that community also immigrated to Israel about 10 years ago. Um, so that was the Kaifeng Jewish um, story. Then um, in the 19th century, um, and we've, we've seen this picture already from Sarah. Okay, and so that's um, uh, uh, you know, kind of the main, um, I would say the main Jewish immigration into China. The first group of Jews, um, you know, arrived, actually arrived in Hong Kong. Um, in 1842, after the first Anglo-China War, um, better known as the Opium War to the Western world now. And uh, most of them um, came via um, the then British Bombay and Kolkata. And, and most, you know, all these people are Safadis. Um, before, uh, you know, the Opium War, a number of them had already been trading in Canton. And, um, and David Sassoon, they were a Safadi textile merchant. Um, they came from Baghdad, as we know. And, uh, and they, have, they have also been selling opium to the Chinese for a number of years prior to the opium war. And during the war, um, David Sassoon sent his oldest son, Elias, um, Elias um, David Sassoon, to Hong Kong to cash in on the opium trade. Um, the, and in the aftermath of the Opium War, the Treaty of Lanking in 1842 forced China to open five ports to foreign trade. And three years later, in 1845, the Sassoons opened a branch of their commercial operation in Shanghai, which was one of the treaty, um, the ports which was opened for trade. Um, and by 1870s, the David Sassoon Song and Company was um, um, became in dispute the largest opium importer in China. In the meantime, um, the Sassoons also overtook the Parsis to dominate the British textile trade. The younger generation of the Sassoons, um, as well as some other Jewish merchants, um, such as, uh, um, yeah, I, I don't have an image of Kaduri, but this is the other person, Celius Aaron Hadun. He was uh, one of the um, Sassoon's in, the firm's employee, and uh, they would widen their business interest into shipping, uh, banking, and land speculation. That land uh, speculation become uh, much more. They they soon you know, discovered land speculation become much more profitable than actually trade. So they stopped, you know, kind of selling opium and uh, switched on, and that's what um, um, Sassoon um, well uh, well. The Hardung normally, uh, you know, he, he, that's what he made his money from. He, um, he's one of my favorite characters, Hardung. He's very interesting, very, very colorful. He um, joined the Sassoon firm as a, a clerk. And, um, and then he rose to quite high position and, um, and become you know, kind of very powerful and quite wealthy. And he is, um, while he remained Jewish, you know, kind of all his life, he um, he married a uh, Buddhist um, and Eurasian Buddhist. I don't have um, here. The, his his wife is um, I don't know the, that that's his wife, um, Lord Jaling. She's very beautiful. She was also the um, you know kind of a goddaughter of Doge's Empress, and um, um, he um, so he was very. Um, um, Celius Hardung, while he remained Jewish, he also become very sort of, um, you know, integrated, you could say the word, into the local sort of thing. And um, this, um, he's, um, he built this, um, um, uh, what you call an island garden, yeah, uh, known as Hardung Garden. It's one of the you know, kind of famous sites in um, Shanghai. And uh, um, his island garden had become, you know, kind of, um, home for a number of Chinese revolutionaries, include Dr. Sen Yatian. This is Dr. Sen Yatian. He was the, the founder of the Chinese revolution, the founder of, uh, you know, kind of Republic in China. 
And so, um, so he and um, he's um, you know the Island Garden become a place where the Chinese revolutionaries met, um, you know, kind of because they were escaping sort of um, uh, being um, arrested. So they but they would use the Island Garden as a shelter, which is very interesting. Then when um, Hardung died, by uh, you know, kind of when Hardung died, he he become the richest man in the Far East. Yeah, and his funeral, and um, it was some. Um, and this this was um, he, he you know, the 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 site for his funeral and he his funeral was um, um, conducted by a rabbi a Taoist and um, you know, a scripturator and a, a Buddhist priest and so uh, you know kind of it was um, um, so it, it just shows that Hardung he was one of those typical. Um, what you call Eurasian, they were uh, so cosmopolitan, you know, kind of while he remained Jewish, but he's not, um, you know, kind of, um, he also embraced other um, identities as well, you know, he, you could, you know, he was, um, that's why, you know, his funeral, I mean, his funeral tells, you know, kind of the story of his life. Yeah, he, he's Jewish, but he's more than just Jewish. Um, okay, and um, so, um, yeah. Ah, okay. Sorry. I have um lots of pictures. So this um, you know, as um, um we just go back to Hong Kong again, you know, from Shanghai. Um in and um, so as um, in the early days, as most of the member of the Hong Kong Jewish community were Safardi merchants and uh, they mostly you know kind of uh, the employees of um, the um, Sarsung company. So uh, as the number um, of the Jews increased over the years, a formal Jewish life began to establish itself. Um, the Sarsungs, um, they, they purchased um, this um, piece of land. So they, uh, you know, um, they, yeah, then they, they, per they, they felt that there was, it was necessary to have a regular place of worship um, for this ever expanding Jewish community. So in 1867, they leased um, a, a premises on Hollywood Road um, in central Hong Kong. And this um, was the earliest synagogue in Hong Kong. And, um, and the other thing is uh, um, in, they also, um, the, the Jewish community also uh, least uh, uh, land, you know, kind of um, in a Chinese village called Wen Nai Chang. It's today's Happy Valley, and uh, um, they built uh, a, a Jewish cemetery, um, you know, in this place. And they they got to the Crown Nice, um, you know, from the British and uh, built the Jewish cemetery um, here. And the cemetery is still here. Uh, it's still in the in Happy Valley. This place. As um, the employer of um, you know forty um, Safadis, the younger Sassoons become the lateral leader um, of the Hong Kong Jewish community um, in the eighteen eighty one, and the um, they purchase well. The, this actually is um, um you know they um the the grandson of David Sassoon Jacob, um, and uh, Edward and Major. Sarah probably knows all those names. Um, they donated a section of the Sassoon estate um, in central Hong Kong. It's um, in today's Kane Road and Robinson Road above the city center to the Jewish community. And in addition to you know, um, giving this piece of land, they also give money um, to the community to build a new synagogue. Um, in return, they requested the synagogue be named in memory of their mother, Leah, so the synagogue is called Ohelia Synagogue. It's still there. It's a very beautiful um, you know, um, a place. It, it's also become a major um, heritage site for Hong Kong. So alongside of the Sassoons, um, Eli Kaduri and uh, his sons, um, yeah, they, uh, Eli Kaduri was a former employee of the David Sassoon Company and his son brother Elias Kaduri also took up active role in needing the Hong Kong Jewish life. Um, the Hong Kong Jewish Recreational um, Club, 
It's um, um, the, today the home of the Jewish Community Center in Hong Kong. It was first started in 1605 as uh, it was a quite modest association. But um, Elias Kaduri, he had married, he married a Safadi from England. He was very attracted to Victorian English life and he wanted to introduce the English club to Hong Kong Jewish life. So he would turn um, this, um, um, the, the Jewish recreational club into a Victorian club, um, according to him, fit for the Hong Kong colonial life. So the new club building you know, opened in 1609 and it became the focus of uh, um, Jewish social life in Hong Kong for the great part of the 20th century. Today is still you know, center of the Jewish life there. So, also um, mikva in there and uh, as well as a uh, um, Jewish preschool. By the turn of the 20th century, the Kaduris and Sassoons were among some of the most prominent families in Hong Kong's economic and civic culture. Even until today, uh, their names are enshrined in streets, buildings and institutions across the territory. Um, I don't know whether any of you have been to Hong Kong, but when you walk around Hong Kong, you see all this, you know, kind of Jewish lanes all over the place. And why, so as I said, the O'Hare Lea Synagogue, which is just, you know, kind of adjusting to the um, Jewish center, you can see actually here, this is some, um, uh, you know, kind of the top of the synagogue, um, ha uh, had, you know, ha has become a part of uh, Hong Kong's historical and cultural, he cultural heritage, the Kaduris, the name behind one of um, Hong Kong's most famous landmark, the Peninsula Hotel. Um, the Kaduris are also the founder of um, um, the China and Night, um, the you know kind of responsible um, for illuminating the streets of Hong Kong and supplying electricity of eighty percent of the territory's population. And the company's Castle Peak Power Station, first built in 18, uh, 1980s, was still um, was at the time and still is one of the largest and most modern coal-fired power station in the world. And being key players of the city, the Kaduris are also famous for their philanthropy work amongst um, the non-Jewish population in Hong Kong. Um, this is um, in 18, uh, in, sorry, in 1910s, the Kaduris opened a school for the Chinese and um, um, another for the Hindus, as well as Helena May, a home for English working girls in Hong Kong. Another member of the Hong Kong jury, um, it's um, Emmanuel um, Raffo Elia Los. Um, sorry about my pronunciation. He was also famous for his uh, philanthropy work to promote the welfare and education of Chinese girls who were driven by crime and prostitution um, because of the poverty. He gave money to the Hong Kong colonial government to build the central school for girls. And the school was later renamed, you know, kind of after him, um, Billy's Public School and in honor of him. And the school is still there today. Um, and um, 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 was the oldest member of the Safadi synagogue. Um, he, um, but he is quite interesting because, as I said earlier, most of the uh, Safadi communities they are from Baghdad, yeah, while the British from Bay. And um, Belilius, he was different. He was a Venetian by origin, so he did not see eye to eye with the other Safadis who had, you know, came from Arab land. Also, they didn't speak the same language because um, Arabic, and Sarah would know, was the lingua franca amongst the Jews of Bangladesh, whereas um, Belilius, he spoke a different language. So he was um, um, much more interested in to become identified with the British elites. And, and so to begin with, it's, um, he, he's another very colorful character. To begin with, he played the Jewish card by making attempts to establish ties with the British Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli. And um, so this resulted in building the Beaconsfield Arcade in central Hong Kong and, and 
named in Disraeli's honor. And in 1879, he also gave 1,000 pounds, it was lots of money at the time, to the British governor of Hong Kong, um, you know, to erect, uh, er trying to erect a statue of Disraeli in Hong Kong. But uh, his offer was rejected by Disraeli himself. So instead, he used the money to, um, um, to set up a medical scholarship fund named after him and also helped to establish the Allison Memorial Hospital. And the, the hospital later served as one of the major teaching hospitals for students of Hong Kong College of Medicine. Really was a, a fascinating presentation and um, so many interesting details there. And I really like the way it sort of interweaves with the Sassoon story um, from Sarah as well. Thank you very much for that. Please feel free to submit questions if you're watching as well. I'm very interested in putting those to the panel too. But just to uh, start those off, Sarah, um, I was really interested in your, um, in your story about uh, Iraqi Jewry in Bombay. My family of Iraqi Jews um, were, you know, I, I grew up listening to music from the Middle East, including, you know, Iraqi Jewish music traditions, musicians such as the Al Kuwaiti brothers or, uh, you know, Nadim Al Ghazali, who I'm sure you know, but I'm really interested in what you think about the degree to which Iraqi Jewish musician music traditions in Bombay continued. I know your group, Rivers of Babylon, um, are featured as part of the British Library exhibition, Hebrew Manus manuscripts, but to what extent, what, what was that continuation like? Um, how did it change and develop in Bombay? Yes, um, well, even today, if you go to Bombay and visit the synagogues, some of the melodies are still um, in the Iraqi Jewish tradition. How long that will last, I don't know. Um, so as I would say, um, from the religious point of view, that has been, that has carried on all the time. Um, of course, there were changes as well, um, but also, let's say in the 1930s, 1940s still, there were people who were, there were musicians who were singing in Arabic, whether it was Judeo Arabic or the songs of Nadam al Ghazali, or bringing in, bringing in music from Iraq still, the Il Kuwaiti brothers, um, so they were still very much aware of what was happening in Baghdad and carrying on with those traditions. But of course, things did change gradually. And um, in Bombay, certainly when I was growing up, we had visiting musicians like Arthur Rubinstein. So we had classical, Western classical music. We had Aka Bilk and David, Dave Brubeck. So we had jazz. Um, so, so really, uh, there was a lot of Western popular influence as well as classical music. Um, also, it's very interesting that uh, Jewish musicians in Bombay um, were very important in Indian film. So we had, um, for example, Faisullah Tagioff, who was from Central Asia, a brilliant mandolin player, and he was very well known for his playing in Indian film. Um, as was uh, David Saab, who um, was called David Saab, but he was uh, Jewish and he played mandolin as well, Isaac Dundaker. Um, so we, we, you know, there, both things were going on. We were still continuing with the old traditions and being introduced to Western traditions and entering uh, Indian traditions as well. Uh, if I have just another second, um, one of the songs that we sang in Habonim, um, was heard by one of the um, music producers for Indian film. And he put that melody, there's more than one Jewish melody actually sung in Indian film to Hindi words. So um, yeah, so there's a lot of mixing going on, which was great. Yeah, yeah that sounds so interesting. Thank you for that. Um, Joanne, there's so many things that I wanna ask you about, but what one thing that really sort of got my curiosity was about the, um, your, your, the story that, about your grandmother who gave you the Philo Atlas, the book that was published at that time to give information about where in the world refugees could come in. How, how did that book come about and how did it get into circulation? 
so the the uh, the Jewish organisations in Germany uh, had started uh, were were voluntary organisations. They became representative organisations, and they became um, in the end part of the state apparatus. But they made it their business to to find ways in which they could help Jews who wanted to emigrate. I think it's true to say that up until um, up until 35, most German Jews thought that there would be space for them in Germany and that once the initial anti-Semitism of the regime had sort of died down, things would be okay. But um, with the changes in Nazi policy and, and persecution in, intensifying, particularly after Kristallnacht, which was the burning of synagogues in November 1938, there was an, an official Jewish community acknowledgement that there was no future for German Jews. And then with the occupation of Austria and the creation of the Office for the Reich, um, which, uh, which was vicious and um, tragic and basically turned Jews from uh, citizens into penniless refugees through the process of chucking them out. So there were mass arrests, uh, Saxon Housing concentration camp and others were used. And the only exit from these concentration camps was either death through brutality or having a ticket to go somewhere. And what's interesting about the Philo Lexicon is that I think, I don't know the complete history of it, but I think it was published in 34 and 35. And it did provide information about places around the world that had Jewish communities and places around the world that didn't require visas. And of course, the two organizations in Germany or the two communities that were most interested in it was the Office for Reich Emigration uh, and the Jewish communities. And so you had the Nazi authorities and the Jewish communities knowing the most about where they could find loopholes and, and places. And so my grandmother who came to the UK as a refugee in 1937 um, was um, a very assimilated German Jew whose bookcases in London were full of, of sort of German philosophy and German classics, but also uh, a whole history of what happened to the Jewish community in Germany, which is actually where I got my interest in initially in learning more about the history of, of, of what happened during the Holocaust. So interesting. Thanks so much for that. Um, and finally, I just wanted to ask Shunjo, um, such an incredible cr chronology and chronicle of, of life, Jewish life in China. One of the things that I wondered if you could expand on was you mentioned that, you know, in 1949, China started to document ethnic groups, so categorize ethnic groups, but the Chinese community, the Jewish Chinese community then in Kaifeng didn't want to be categorized in that way. Do you, do you know what that was about? Can you expand on that a little bit? Um, part of the reason is, um, you know, you, uh, they probably didn't feel that um, they want to become a minority because once you become one of the ethnic group, then you become minority, and um, they wanted to become. Uh, they wanted to be part of the uh, you know, kind of majority, the the Chinese population. So on their identity card, they actually had Han, yeah, which is um, you know, kind of the the Chinese ethnic um, sort of category. So they had Han stamped uh, in their um, uh, you know kind of identity card. Um, but um, interestingly, and in, uh, sort of after the nineties, because um, the Western fascination, mostly American Jews, who went to you know kind of Kaifeng to look for this um, uh, Jewish community, yeah, and uh, and so there was prospect of you know kind of them if they become Jewish, um, then they could move to uh, immigrate to Israel. So some of them start in you know, a kind of um, wanting to have that Jewish identity. But um, then the Chinese government refused um, to acknowledge that. So identity politics, yeah, and it's um, everywhere and it's here. And, and could I just add some, because the refugee story is very interesting. Re um, the, um, because this also, well, in the, um, the there are two stories um, amongst, you know, kind of the Safadi community and uh, the Jewish refugees. The first wave of Jewish refugees came, um, you know, as a result of the pogroms 
um, so they they came the Jewish refugee came from you know kind of Russia and uh, Balkans and these were Ashkenazi Jew and um, and so they um, they are different from the Safadis who had established themselves so there's lots of conflicts and the Safadis somehow feel that um, you know kind of they didn't really want to um, um, be associated with some. Um, and the Ashkenazis, because uh, many of these Ashkenazis, they were quite poor, yeah, and they, they were involved in street boarding assaults and, uh, you know, kind of etc. So it became, a, they saw them as an embarrassment. And in the end, and the two, com and two community, well, they had to split. So the um, Ashkenazis actually hired another place themselves and where they would meet you know, kind of uh, um, rather than join the Safa, Safadi synagogue. But um, um, by the, during the Second World War, when there's some um, large influx of Jewish refugees came from, you know, kind of uh, Europe, and um, they passed through Hong Kong. And uh, um, by then, the um, Jewish community under the Kaduri's leadership, they had to show um, uh, you know, kind of a lot of um, um, hospitality towards they the, they call them Jewish brothers, and so had, this is um, one of the things Kaduri appealed to the Hong Kong Jewish the Safadi community to unite together and help the um, the um, Jew, uh, refugees from Europe, and this is why he said today more than ever is um, um, the duty of every Jew to realize his responsibility. So he, um, in 47, you know, kind of when, when the war ended, a lot of um, refugees, they first went to Shanghai and so then they, um, they, after the war, they were leaving China. They were going to like Palestine, North America and Australia en route. And they, they all had to pass through Hong Kong. So when they, um, you know, kind of all arrived in Hong Kong and uh, because uh, partly Kaduri says in fear of anti-Semitism, he had, um, you know, kind of got involved, um, you know, and so he turned to the Peninsula Hotel, um, you know, kind of um, as a refugee camp, quite luxury refugee camp. Some of my friends actually stayed in there, um, you know, kind of they, they went later on, they went to Israel. And uh, um, so I, I, well, I, I have, a, I had an image, but I won't show you now. And um, so then the, 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 the Peninsula Hotel, the ballroom in the Peninsula Hotel was made into makeshifts um, synagogue for the Jewish refugees. And he actually, he also, um, you know, kind of um, appeal, he wrote thousands of letters to governments, NGO and individuals to guarantee, um, you know, the successful repatriation of the Jewish refugees. Thank you. So that Thank was for the, um, you know, kind of my um, story for the add to the refugee story. Thank you so much. That's an incredible story. Um, I know I'm now going to open out to questions. Um, from people watching and thank you so much for those. The first one is for um, Joanna. This is from Emil Cohen, Cohen, who says, Joanna's presentation is absolutely fascinating as I've not even heard of Jewish refugees in Trinidad. There was a reference to refugee agencies. Would that be the Jewish agencies and were there any attempts to migrate these people to Israel? Um, so the Jewish agencies I'm talking about are a network of agencies that are actually set up in the late 19th century uh, to help the big migration from Eastern Europe to, the, to America. You know, um, and thousands of, 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 of Jews emigrate at that time, as did Irish and Germans and others uh, for a new world. And at the time, agencies were set up from the East through to the West to help the migrants pass through. And also to, to an extent to also send migrants back. This was the period of the Gold Medina where the pavements were meant to be golden in New York. And so they were really well set up. So the irony again is that on the one hand, when you really need them in the beginning of the 1930s and there's a crisis, you have the most well-established network of Jewish agencies, international agencies that are national based, but work together, actually most powerless in their whole history because the, uh, the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, which had the most funding, took over really from the UK 
funded agencies in terms of funding, rescue and relief, but they had no power. And there was huge fights. It's fascinating to, to look at the histories of these Jewish organizations and between the, the political ones who wanted, for example, like the World Jewish Congress to fight for the creation of Israel and to be explicit about what was happening to Jews in Europe. And the other agencies who preferred, particularly in the 1930s, backdoor diplomacy that didn't push the Jewish, um, that didn't push the, the point about the, the persecution of the Jews in particular because of this terrible dilemma where Western democracies felt that by acknowledging that it was only Jews being persecuted, they were actually doing what the Nazis were doing and robbing these citizens of Germany or Austria of their citizenship and their status as, uh, uh, as nationals, which is what the Nazi state was doing. So um, these Jewish agencies worked together. Most were national agencies and some were, were international. Um, and they, after the war, did fund refugee passage. Uh, for example, the Joint had an office in Rome and helped uh, refugees escape. There was a lot of illegal immigration to Palestine shortly after the war. Uh, and they also helped um, refugees move to other countries. In fact, countries like South Africa, other countries across the colonial empire at that point did start to. It's worth noting that very few refugees after the war were allowed into Britain. Uh, Britain maintained its policy all the way through from the 1930s to post-war that they had an immigration policy. It's only really with the United Nations uh, Declaration of Human Rights and the refugee legislation, which came as a result of the Holocaust, that refugees today have rights. Uh, at that time, there were no rights. So refugee agencies were working in a kind of unregulated way, in a way, working across and between existing immigration requirements. That's great. Thank you so much for that answer, uh, Joanna. Um, next, we have one for Sarah, which is from Monica Goodwin, who asks, uh, thank you for all these questions, by the way. Um, Monica asks, even though you did not hear the word anti-Semitism, the fact is your family left Baghdad. Did they ever talk to you about why they left and the events that led up to their exodus to India and why India? Sarah. Thank you. Um, yes, there was no, I say, you know, anti-Semitism in India is how I certainly remember things. And certainly David Sassoon left because of um, persecution in Baghdad. That is well known. And many, many Jews did leave because of persecution in Baghdad, even in 1941. There had been the pogrom, the Farhud in Baghdad, and a number of uh, Jews then came to India. Um, and even before that, um, I know some musicians who in the nine, say 1910, 1915, were in the Turkish army, in the Ottoman army, and having to fight wars there, and their sister bought them out and then brought them to India. So certainly people did leave Iraq um, to come to India because of persecution. Um, Apart from, I mean, my parents, my mother's family didn't leave because of persecution. So some people came because of persecution and others came for business. There, there were business opportunities in India. Um, so those were the two reasons. But uh, having grown up there with friends, you know, from all different um, spheres like Zoroastrians and Christians and Mohammedans and Hindus and Buddhists, everyone was different. So in that sense, everyone was the same. And then there was certainly no anti-Semitism then. I hope that answers it. Thank you so much for that, Sarah. I, that's, that's a great answer. Um, and I just wanted to move uh, onto our final question for today. Um, and thank you all for sending these through. This one is um, from Dori Schmetterling and it's for Shunjo. Uh, when do you think real Jews disappeared from in Kaifeng? Those that knew about the practices and went to the synagogue, at least occasionally. Um, and she adds, I thought I read a while ago that a group of Chinese people of claimed Jewish descent immigrated to Israel, not just once, though they had to go through a formal conversion process. Well, in... I mean, when certainly in the 19th century, by the end, you know, kind of a turn of the 20th century, when the Protestant missionary went to Kaifeng, none of the um, community members speaks any Hebrew. They didn't really keep any traditions. 
Um, so um, the other thing which um, recent, um, about 20 years ago when I went to Kaifeng, um, I actually asked them, uh, you know, kind of, um, you know, how do you keep your Jewishness? How, you know, kind of, where do you get uh, your Jewish education from? Because um, all the, um, you know, kind of, they, they go by the um, father's bloodline, yeah? So and the father's family line. And so um, I said, you know, kind of, um, because uh, and you, you normally that you would go by mother's line, yeah? And uh, um, they said, um, it's very interesting answer. They said, oh, this is China. We go by the father, you know that. Um, so, yeah, it's, um, um, it's interesting. They said it's more complex question, you know, kind of how, when did they cease to become Jewish? Um, or were, were they, there, there are also different Jewish communities, I would just say, and, uh, you know, kind of may, maybe China is too far. And after the, I, I would imagine these people had to come from, you know, kind of uh, during the Mongol period. And uh, um, they probably come from Central Asia somewhere. And um, then they were unable, you know, um, to travel back to get instruction, you know, kind of for everything. And uh, gradually over time, so they had, you know, kind of lost that connection with um, um, the, what you probably call the, the center, yeah? Then they become more and more peripheral. And then they become a sonified, like uh, many of the Muslim, uh, uh, you know, kind of Muslim community, they become sonified and they become an uh, ethnic group rather than a religious group. Um, That's great. Thank you so much for that. Um, I also want to thank everyone for the questions and apologies if we didn't have time to get through to all of them, but we must now close this session. Um, I found it absolutely fascinating. I learned so much from these three panelists and I'm left curious about much more that, that, that they each raised in their discussions, which I think is a great way to leave it. Um, I hope that all of you watching felt the same and that you all uh, enjoyed this session too. I want to thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Um, and thank you all for putting through the questions. And I'm going to leave the final farewell uh, to the curator, Liana Tahan. Um, so on that note, I will leave you all with thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, we hope you have enjoyed today's event. A big thank you to the panel and a very special thank you to our partners, Jewish Book Week, for working with us on this event. Please fill up the feedback form. We'd like to know what you think of our online events. And do please keep an eye on what's on pages on our website for more exciting events. Thank you again for joining us today.